Hey there, welcome back to the second part of this journey. Today we are taking a leap into the world of advanced area computations. Students of all ages have to compute areas. It starts with simple geometric shapes like squares, rectangles and triangles. In course of their education, students are exposed to more and more sophisticated tools. The first non-trivial area that students come across is the area of a circle where for the first time the transcendental number pi appears. With calculus, we eventually learn to calculate areas between any two continuous functions. This seems to be more or less the end of the story, being equipped with an almighty tool. But as in almost all cases, having left school only means that you have explored the ground floor of a skyscraper full of wisdom. In this video, we want to explore a different level much higher in the building of area computations and attack the area of the Mandelbrot set. So buckle up as we skip the stairs and take the elevator to discover the area of the Mandelbrot set in a way you've probably never seen before. We've seen in the last video how a simple circle is projected onto the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. The more terms we consider in the mapping polynomial, the closer we get to the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. And hold your breath, all it takes for the computation of the area is summing the squares of all the coefficients and weight their contributions with the size of the corresponding mapping exponent. Could you think of something more elementary and elegant? And if you are familiar with Fourier transformations, we basically sum up the squares of Fourier coefficients and weight their contributions with the corresponding frequency. In our computation we include 20,000 coefficients. Even at this level of approximation, one can clearly see the gap between the circle mapping and the true boundary. So the result can only be considered as an upper bound on the area of the Mandelbrot set. But in principle, if infinitely many coefficients could be summed, we would compute its true area. Similar computations have been performed with 5 million coefficients, further lowering this bound. As always, you can find references for more details in the video description. But here's the big question. How is it possible that we can determine the area of the Mandelbrot set at all, when we are only working with the Fourier coefficients of its boundary? There is a deeply rooted mathematical theorem that justifies our approach. It is called Stokes theorem, the magic wizard of our area calculations. If you find yourself puzzled by looking at the nine symbols of Stokes theorem, and if you only recognize the equal sign and the symbol for integration, don't worry. We are about to unravel the magic behind this masterpiece of abstract notation. The theorem is so powerful that it holds in every possible dimension. Moreover, it relates two different types of integrals with each other, and it even works in curved geometries. There are countless examples where this formula is used, and we will start with one that every student of calculus has learned in school. The letter omega represents an arbitrary domain of integration. It can be as complicated as the Mandelbrot set, or some abstract seven-dimensional manifold, or even the entire universe. But it could also be as simple as an interval along the real axis. The notation df for a function of one variable can be written as its derivative combined with the differential of the independent variable. The simple partial omega refers to the boundary of omega, which in the case of an interval on the real axis is just the start and the end point of this interval. Now Stokes' theorem just tells us that the value of the integral on the left hand side is obtained when the antiderivative of f prime is evaluated at the two boundary points. Without a lot of effort, we have rediscovered the fundamental theorem of calculus. Before we dive deeper into the magic of Stokes' theorem, let us become familiar with a particular kind of circle mappings. A circle is most conveniently described inside the complex plane as a complex parametric curve. All the complex numbers with the distance r to the origin are parametrized by the exponential of i times phi, where phi corresponds to the angle that the point is rotated away from the real axis. The angle is commonly highlighted with a u value that runs through all colors of the color space. Zero is mapped to the color red, the imaginary direction at 90 degrees corresponds to green, and negative real values at 180 degrees are color coded in light blue. 
the factor r in front of the exponential scales the size of the circle. We now use simple polynomials to map this circle into differently shaped curves. The simplest case is a linear polynomial. It just changes the size of the circle. Even simpler, a constant term would only change the location of the circle. As a next step, we naturally investigate the action of a quadratic term. As you can witness in the animation, a double cover of the circle is created. We all know that minus 1 squares to 1. It's plain to see how the negative range, the light blue part of the original circle, gets mapped into the positive values, and the full circle transforms continuously. To see this more clearly, we turn the circle edge on and lift the degeneracy between the two circles. Also note that the green and purple part of the original circle have turned into the new negative part, which reflects the properties of the imaginary unit squaring to negative 1. Negative powers in the polynomials further increase the richness of features that can appear in the shapes of the resulting curves. If you are familiar with Lissajous figures, here you can see one of them. In principle, there is almost no limit on the shapes that the initial circle can be mapped into. In the last video, we found polynomials that map the circle into curves that approximate the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. To create this curve with all its details, about 2000 monomials are used for the mapping. The constant term just shifts the circle by one half to the left, and all the remaining negative powers introduce features observable at various different scales. We can understand the mapping of the circle that is provided by the polynomials in yet another way. For each possible value of the angular coordinate phi, you can imagine an arrow that is rotated against the real axis by this particular angle. As phi varies from 0 to 2 pi, the tip of the arrow exactly draws the circle that is represented by the exponential function with a pure imaginary argument. We now look at four different possible monomials and identify the geometric meaning of each term. Each monomial can be illustrated by an individual arrow. The absolute value of the coefficient translates into its length, and the face of the coefficient provides the initial orientation of the arrow. In our case, three arrows point along the positive real line, and the last one points into the negative direction. The exponent leaves its imprint in the way the arrow rotates. Positive exponents yield counterclockwise rotations and negative exponents cause the arrow to spin clockwise. For powers of 2 or minus 2, the corresponding arrows rotate twice as fast. But don't forget, each of the terms is just a complex number. When the monomials are added to build a polynomial, the corresponding arrows are just attached to each other tip to tail. The individual motion of each single arrow is turned into a joint effort, and the chain of arrows traces the shape of the curve that the circle is mapped into by the polynomial. Have a look at the few snapshots that nicely show the intricate interplay of the arrows to reach the origin. Now we are ready to unravel the mystery of Stokes theorem. We will move in small steps and first look at the two possibilities it provides for the area computation of a circle. On the right hand side, the integration is performed over a one form f. We don't want to dive into too much details of forms. Instead, we present an operational representation for a generic one form. It consists of two arbitrary functions p and q of the coordinates x and y. Each function is multiplied with a differential which represents a basis in the space of one forms. On the left hand side, the integrand is given by the exterior derivative of f. We simply show how it is computed. Now each term is equipped with two differentials combined with a wedge product. This product is anti-symmetric, which allows to simplify and combine two terms into a single expression. If we want to measure the area, we need to replace a general form f by a particular form. The wedge product is nothing but the infinitesimal area element. When the value of the two form is 1 on the area of the circle, we actually compute its area. We can make various choices for p and q that lead to a constant two form of value 1. We take the most symmetric choice, where p and q contribute equal amounts. 
This translates the two-dimensional area integral on the left-hand side into a one-dimensional line integral along the boundary of the circle. We have learned already how to parametrize the boundary of the circle. A convenient curve parameter is given by the angle phi. For each value of phi, we obtain a particular point on the circle. The x and y coordinates of this point can be expressed in terms of cosine and sine functions. If we consider the plane as complex plane, the two terms unify into the complex exponentiation of a pure phase. The coordinate differentials can be re-expressed in terms of the differential for our curve parameter phi. When we substitute all these expressions into the line integral, all trigonometric functions sum up to 1 and we find the correct area for our circle. The area computation for our circle mappings turn out to be most easily performed in the complex plane. The integrand is nothing but the imaginary part of the product of the conjugate of z times dz. The differential dz relates to the differential of d phi by a simple derivative of an exponential function. The product turns into a double sum and the imaginary part combined with the factor i picks out the cosine term from the complex exponential. The integration kills almost all terms since the cosine function generates equal positive and negative contributions between 0 and 2 pi. Only for the case when m is equal to n, the cosine turns into the trivial constant function. This collapses the double sum and we obtain our final expression. We just have to square the coefficients of the polynomial and sum them up weighted with the power m of the corresponding monomial. All but the first term will enter negatively for our mappings of the Mandelbrot z level curves. If you want to apply Stokes theorem in a small exercise, try to compute the area enclosed by this curve. Unfortunately, it's not sufficient to just perform the weighted sum. If you apply the last formula and plug in the coefficients and exponents from the polynomial mapping, you end up with zero. This is reasonable because the left and right area are encircled in opposite directions and therefore cancel each other. However, we are interested in the unsigned total area. You can find it out when you only use half of the curve that corresponds to phi varying between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. In such a case, the line integral of Stokes' theorem has to be computed explicitly. If you double the obtained result, it should correspond to the area enclosed by this curve. We have created a multiple choice question sheet where you can hopefully confirm your result with one of the choices provided. If you don't want to perform the computations but nevertheless want to take part in the survey, we provided a hint with a little Monte Carlo simulation. For this particular simulation, 10,000 points were scattered randomly in the displayed part of the complex plane. Only 3,348 of them managed to hit the target area. This probabilistic argument can be translated into an area estimate. Finally, we are going to apply Stokes' theorem to a contour line of the Mandelbrot set. It surrounds all points of the complex plane, for which the absolute value of the tenth iteration is still smaller than 2. It took Mathematica about 10 hours to compute the 2000 coefficients that are needed to grow this curve with all its details. Now we can use them to compute the area that is surrounded by the curve. To confirm the result with a different method, we just count the pixels inside the curve. In a low resolution scan, we find 152 of 900 pixels inside, leading to an area estimate of 1.52. When the resolution is increased, we get better estimates, roughly converging to 1.96. The weighted sum of the 2000 coefficients yields the same result. Isn't it amazing? And again, the truly mesmerizing part of this story is the very different nature how the two results are obtained. The first method tediously lays out the entire area with little squares and just counts the number of them that fit inside. The second method measures the size of the enclosed area holographically. The area is completely inferred from the properties of its boundary. The success of this method is based on Stokes' theorem. In a last effort, we want to release the full power of Stokes' theorem and use it to compute the area enclosed by a curve on the Riemann sphere. To do so, we project our well-known curve of the tenth Mandelbrot z iteration by stereographic projection onto the Riemann sphere. In an earlier video, we tried to visualize the ideas behind the stereographic projection. 
you can check it out following the link in the top right corner. This time we have to deal with curved geometry. The method of pixel counting has to be modified slightly. We start at the south pole that corresponds to the origin of the complex plane after stereographic projection. Complications show up because the pixels have different size for different values of latitude theta. But as always, it's no big deal to take this into account. A small computer program adds the areas of all the pixels effortlessly even for a much finer grid. When the pixel size is small, the pixels can be treated as small rectangles. And for a sphere covered with about 2 million pixels, we find that roughly 13% of the sphere are surrounded by the curve. Let's now reproduce this result with Stokes theorem. This time we have to find a one form f whose exterior derivative yields the surface area element on the sphere, which is given by the sign of the latitude theta. We skip some details, but a good choice for the one form is one minus the cosine of theta. Now we have to remember that our curve is the image of a circle that was first mapped by a polynomial and then projected stereographically. Therefore, the cosine of theta along the yellow curve can be expressed as a function of the parameter script phi that parameterizes the original circle. Similarly, the longitude value of each point on the curve depends on this parameter due to the circular mapping. Therefore, the range of integration can be pulled back to an integration along the initial circle. Unfortunately, the integral does not evaluate to a simple expression in the coefficients as it was the case for the flat complex plane. Therefore, we have to live with a numerical integration for a few hundred terms, which yields a result very close to the area that we obtain from pixel counting. Each result by itself is rather weak. Each value is obtained by a tedious calculation involving lots of number crunching, where lots of errors can sneak in. However, since we found the same result with two completely different calculations, the answer becomes much more reliable. Of course, in real life, nobody cares about the area of the Mandelbrot set on the Riemann sphere. But the strategy to prove results with alternative computations is very common practice in science. Another thing that people care about a lot is the power of Stokes' theorem, which relates integrals of forms over arbitrary domains to related forms along the boundary of the domain. It shows that integration is a very constrained process that can always be reduced by one dimension when the domain of integration has a boundary. We also remind on the incredible compactness and abstract notation of forms, which makes Stokes' theorem completely generic and applicable to curved geometries with an arbitrary number of dimensions. We close with these thoughts and hope to see you again next time. Bye bye.